Welcome to the history and geography of uh, the Holy Lands, Palestine. Uh, this is week uh, three. We're going to be looking at uh, sort of the history of um, Palestine, uh, working from uh, the New Testament into the present day. Uh, so we're going to pick up the, the story now in the New Testament and the influence of Rome, uh, which is more of a political influence than a cultural one, as we can see in the successors to Herod the Great. But notice as you look here on this uh, table, you know how many times uh, the temple is destroyed and rebuilt. Uh, Bab Babylon came in in about 600 uh, BC and destroyed the temple in the fall of Jerusalem. It was then rebuilt about 80 years later. And then uh, Herod uh, did a sort of a major rebuilding project in about 63 or 40 BC, and the temple was rebuilt. And it was about finished during the life of Jesus and then was uh, in existence for about 40 years. And then behind my little picture here, the uh, Romans came in and destroyed the temple one more time. And it has stayed uh, fallen or destroyed uh, since then. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, when Alexander the Great died, uh, his domain was divided up by his generals after a bloody war of succession. And uh, General Ptolemy had Egypt to the south and Sel uh, Seleucus uh, Nicator took over what is now uh, Syria and Turkey. Um, during uh, when uh, the Ptolemies had uh, sort of the control over Jerusalem. It was a fairly benign dictatorship or control. But in about 160 or 200 uh, BC, uh, the Seleucids, Seleucids took over and they were notorious for the persecution of uh, uh, Jewish life and thought. In fact, it got so bad that Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the king of Syria, captured Jerusalem in 167 BC and he desecrated the temple by offering the sacrifice of pig on the altar to Zeus there in the temple. It's called the abomination of desolation. It sounds kind of uh, uh, end of the world kind of language. Um, and even though that was a very traumatic time, it was also during this time uh, that Helen, uh, Hellenism or Greek culture had the most impact on the culture of the Bible and the New Testament. Uh, in throughout all of this region, even into Greece and uh, across all of the yellow area, uh, the Greek culture and language became the dominant form. It, a Greek language and culture became so dominant that about a team of 70 scholars translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek for use. It was called the Septuagint. And that translation took place in uh, Alexandria. And Alexandria became a city of uh, Greek sophistication. Uh, that word Septuagint simply means translation of 70 um, or 72 translators. And, uh, um, and so that happened uh, in 70 BC. Now you say, now why would they translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek? Well, it's because nobody was speaking Hebrew anymore. Hebrew was becoming a forgotten language. And so for people to even have access to the Bible, it was translated into uh, Greek. Uh, it really is an amazing uh, thing that uh, Hebrew was um, resurrected as a living language in the reestablishment of the, uh, Israel. But th this influence of Greek culture uh, is also reflected in the New Testament because Koine Greek, which is sort of the modern Greek of that day, uh, became the language of the people. It was a sort of simplified form of the Greek that was used by Plato and Aristotle. And the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, the letters of Paul and even the Gospels. We have a sense that we're not quite sure whether Jesus spoke uh, Greek or he spoke the language, kind of the language of the people of the time, which was uh, Aramaic. Uh, when we hear uh, the phrase, our father who art in heaven, actually the word our father is uh, in Aramaic and it was simply Abba. Uh, which is not a Greek term, uh, that's an Aramaic uh, term. Um, so probably uh, uh, Jesus spoke an, a Galilean dialect of Aramaic. Um, 
and uh, um, and that and the language of Aramaic actually um, because of uh, the conquests of Assyria and so forth prior to that really kind of became the general language of the people but it wasn't the language of commerce and of education that Greek became uh, when Alexander the Great came in. So you have this overlay of Greek that was used for international conversation, for learning, uh, and actually for a lot of commerce business, a little bit like English is today. And you had Aramaic, which was kind of the language of the local people, the, the language of the fishermen, uh, really. Uh, so you got three languages that function kind of at the same time. You do have the Old Testament in Hebrew, though fewer and fewer people were speaking it. You had Aramaic, which is kind of a derivative of Hebrew, but uh, it was not one that was uh, direct. Um, and then you had Koine Greek, and that is the Greek of the Septuagint Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. So um, Herod the Great, uh, the Greek Empire had a deep influence on the culture of the time. When Rome uh, came into view in about 63 BC uh, with the rise of Herod, Herod entered into an alliance um, with uh, uh, the political power of Rome in order to secure his own power. Um, Rome's, you know, it's kind of like the camel's nose under the tent. Pretty soon uh, they were present in more profound ways with armies and pilots and so forth uh, and exerted a political uh, kind of control, but not really a cultural one. Um, once Rome came in, uh, eventually the language shifted from Greek to Latin, but that took hundreds of years. Uh, it was Jerome in the year 400 AD who then translated the Bible from Greek into, and Hebrew into the Vulgate, at, in other words, the language of the vulgar, which was Latin. And that happened about 400 AD. And Jerome lived in the caves of Bethlehem near the tradition place of the birth of Jesus. So let's uh, continue. Uh, so this is the Holy Land in the time of Jesus' ministry. King Herod the Great died in 4 BC and his kingdom was divided up into smaller governing units. Uh, Herod uh, Antipas had uh, the pink areas and that those were by and large um, a kind of a culturally Jewish uh, sort of area or kingdom. Um, and Herod Antipas is actually the Herod that shows up at the time of Jesus when he was arrested and under trial. Uh, Herod's other son, Philip, read, uh, ruled the red area, and that's called uh, Trachonitis, uh, or Iteria. So um, Philip uh, had control of those area. The green is sort of an independent uh, Greek speaking area called the Decapolis. We know it's Greek because when Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee um, to the area of the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes, uh, there they were keeping a herd of pigs on a hill and only Greeks would be uh, growing pork or raising you know, pigs and for pork and so forth for meat. Um, so that was an independent Greek speaking area. And then uh, the yellow, while um, the culture, I suppose you'd say is Jewish, was under Roman control and under the control of a governor. And it would be governor, and that would be Pontius Pilate at the time of Jesus' death. Um, by the end of uh, 70 AD, this all area was marked the end of any Jewish rule. And uh, um, it was uh, uh, simply no more as a country or even as a kingdom or anything of that sort. So uh, we're going to go back to Rome. And in uh, AD, uh, Jesus dies. And then in the year 70, there is what is called the first Jewish revolt. And Josephus talks about this. Um, you might see, uh, think about them as the zealots of the time uh, rose up uh, against uh, Rome, seeking to reestablish uh, a kind of a pure Jewish identity and nation. Um, and uh, in response, uh, Rome sent Titus, uh, who was an, uh, a general, uh, 
and uh, Titus uh, crushed the revolt in Jerusalem by starving the people out. Uh, when he took over Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple, tore down the walls. Uh, and then those zealots made their way to Masada, and Titus followed. And there you had uh, the siege of Masada uh, eventually. But that wasn't the end of it. Um, about 60 years later, there was another Jewish revolt under, under uh, Bar Kokhba. And this time, Emperor Hadrian uh, went after Bar Kokhba, and uh, that revolt was crushed. And at that point, uh, Rome said, enough is enough. And so all the Jews that were left, anyone that of any standing or religious indication, inclination were simply expelled from Jerusalem and the region. And uh, Greeks and others were brought in. So it was a sort of the great diaspora. And it is from that, uh, that really Jews ended up all over the place. Actually, that diaspora was happening even before that. For we know that Jews were already living in places throughout the Mediterranean. Um, and we know that uh, in the journeys of Paul, as he would go up into the Turkey and even over into Greece, the first thing he would do would be to have, uh, would go to the synagogue and he would talk about Jesus. Well, if you go to a synagogue, that means somebody's already there. Uh, but Paul would talk about Jesus and there would be an argument. He would be kicked out. And then it says the God fears would follow him and they would begin sort of a new worshiping community. Those God fears were actually um, the um, citizens, Romans, often Greeks of the Mediterranean, who were um, captured or captivated um, by uh, the religion of uh the, the witness of Judaism to a God who could not be put into pictures. You know, you shall not make an Im, Im, a graven image of God. There was something mysterious and it seemed truthful uh, about uh, this worship of a God who is not to be confined to images, this God who creates all things and is not just simply a, a demiurge of some kind. And so Paul would talk about um, uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of these uh, promises and that somehow uh, the fulfillment of all that God was about in the scriptures. And so he would draw the uh, God fears, the uh, culturally uh, Jewish or Roman people away from the synagogue. Anyway, so when um, Titus um, or when Hadrian uh, crushed the second Jewish revolt and the Jews were expelled, they went you know, I suppose you might say to various places throughout the Mediterranean and, and beyond. And it really became kind of part of the impetus for Judaism to be a worldwide religion. I mean, that Jews ended up being found in such great numbers, ultimately uh, in uh, Russia, in Poland, in Europe. But I remember uh, traveling to um, Israel 20 years ago and, and our guide who was a Jew, who was a Jewish uh, fellow, uh, stopped uh, a patrol of soldiers. And of these soldiers, there was one uh, who was from uh, South America and he looked South American. Um, there was uh, another one who was from Asia and he looked Asian, but also Jewish. There was somebody else from Russia and there was somebody else whose homeland was in Israel. And you had sort of this international gathering of people all who identified themselves as Jewish uh, and yet so different. Uh, and it goes back to this uh, expelling of the Jews uh, by Hadrian at 135. Um, so we're gonna, um, I think we can continue. Yes, yeah. so here we have the siege of Jerusalem. And essentially what happened is uh, Titus starved the people, surrounded uh, the walls of Jerusalem and um, uh, destroyed uh, the temple, um, though left the foundation stones. And uh, here we have um, Titus triumph over um, Judah or Jerusalem. And this carving is found on a pillar outside of the Colosseum. Uh, and so when Titus went, returned to uh, Rome to celebrate his triumph uh, over uh, the uh, country, or, over, over Israel and the revolt, 
Um, you can see that large menorah that would have been in the temple and the wealth of the temple was brought back to Rome, some of which was used to fund the building of the Colosseum, paying off the debts of that. And that carving is then located on a pillar, a plinth that is outside the Roman uh, Colosseum, in fact, still stands there to this day. We move then to 135. I talked about that. Um, uh, the Jewish War of 135, Simon Bar Kokhba, and it was put down by Hadrian, and they were then scattered. Um, here we have a picture actually of um, Hadrian, um, and Hadrian was a noted general. Uh, not only uh, did he defeat uh, uh, the Jews, but he also uh, rebuilt much of Rome and also. Uh, it was Hadrian's Wall that exists in uh, England that stood as the boundary line between Britain and Scotland and the Picts who were such barbarians to the north. Um, here we have a picture of uh, Constantine, uh, kind of a rep representation of what he might have looked like. Uh, the statue is left as concurrent to when Constantine was emperor. And here we have a picture of um, Jerome in 400 AD um, as he was translating the Bible all by himself from um, Greek and Hebrew into Latin. And uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built in about 400 AD when Constantine uh, became emperor. And it was Mama Constantine, his mother, who actually was a devout Christian, who uh, went to the Holy Land to identify all the sacred sites and then build shrines and churches over them. And then uh, in one place, um, we have uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that was built over the cross and then over the tomb where Jesus was buried. It was an immense uh, building. It's been built and destroyed many times over the centuries, millennia, actually. And I think what we have now is today is just a fraction of what uh, that building was uh, in its origin. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was actually built over the land. And um, um, originally, you can see Golgotha was a um, that brown hill with a cross on the top and then around the corner to the side you know jesus was buried in a tomb and so christ's tomb uh, the church was literally built over uh, the tomb over everything now over the years what happened i think it was uh, the mamelukes in the 1200s uh, in the back and forth between um Christianity and the Crusaders and so forth. When they came in, this time they destroyed uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and they uh, dug away uh, the tomb, just sort of carved it all out so there was nothing left. So what you have today is a little chapel or uh, a church within a church uh, over the site of what would have been inside a cave at that time uh, where Jesus was born. So the site itself is still marked by this uh, building, but you know, when you go into that Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you would almost have to imagine uh, that there would have still been a bunch of earth and a cave within it, but that's all taken away now. Um, so we're going to uh, go back uh, just to kind of so you can see the Christian rule begins in 313 with Constantine and its mother Helena, who is uh, a devout Christian, uh, goes to um, uh, back to the Holy Lands. There, um, at this time, Christianity is legalized, though it's not yet uh, the Church of the State. Um, in fact, uh, Emperor Constantine himself was not baptized until his deathbed. Um, and that's because, you know, if you're baptized, you couldn't commit any more sins. And as an emperor, I guess you had to kill a lot of people to stay in power. So he kept himself pure until he couldn't do any, or kind of kept himself in, in holding until he couldn't do anything wrong, literally on his deathbed, and he was baptized at that point. Mama Helena uh, went to the Holy Lands, identified by tradition the various places, and built churches on these holy places. It was just, uh, I think, one or two uh, 
uh, I think actually after Constantine, there was uh, an emperor who tried to bring, um, uh, resurrect the old pagan uh, religion, uh, but failed. And then Theodosius uh, came on the scene and he is the one that made Christianity the empire of the nation where Christianity then assumed kind of uh, a stature. It was at this time that Jerome went to uh, uh, Bethlehem and there in the caves just next to where Jesus was tradition to be born, uh, translated uh, the Bible into the Vulgate. In the year 600 uh, or thereabouts, uh, Persia uh, came on the scene uh, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was burned and then uh, rebuilt. Uh, so that was a foreign invasion. And then in 638, uh, or actually 570, Muhammad is born. Uh, in 638, Jerusalem is captured by uh, uh, the Muslims. And within 130 years, then the Dopa of the Rock Church is built on the Temple Mount. And there's a time of Islamic rule for about 470 years. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, continues uh, to be in, uh, in place, uh, though it is... Um, uh, Oh, I should just say the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, it's built on the Temple Rock. Nothing had been there since the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD by uh, Titus. So it just it was an open platform. Um, you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is destroyed and rebuilt. So what that also means is between 600 and 1000 AD that Christians and Muslims coexisted in Jerusalem. Um, it was not just simply one or the other, though Christians were, I don't know if a minority, they didn't have ruling authority, uh, but they were a presence. Um, and then in about 1000, uh, 1009 uh, and 1071, um, there is a sort of a back and forth between, it's the time of the Crusades um, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and burned and rebuilt at uh, kind of a chaotic time that way uh, during those about a hundred and some years. Uh, just a couple of pictures. One, this is a picture of the Dome of the Rock. It is the same building that has been there since uh, it was uh, originally built in 690, a very old building. Inside the Dome of the Rock, you can see there it is, the rock. And the rock is where Muhammad went and uh, was uh, lifted up into heaven and the experience of being with God in heaven. And it happened here on this rock. And that is why it is considered one of the most holy sites for uh, Islam. Um, Interesting, um, today uh, there still exist some, um, I, I don't know if they would be Orthodox or, but a, a group of, of Jews who imagine putting the temple back on the Temple Mount and uh, returning to uh, temple sacrifice on the Temple Mount. And in fact, they're even in the process of building all of the altar furnishings in gold or gold leaf or whatever, so that they would be ready to be put back in uh, on the Temple Mount in a rebuilt temple if that time ever came. Uh, most Jews, you know, who are uh, now a people of the book uh, cannot really imagine going back to temple sacrifice, but just a small kind of aside about that. Um, just a note that during its long history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times, and destroyed completely twice, that is by Babylon and Rome. Uh, the oldest part of the city of Jerusalem was settled in the fourth millennium BC. That means you're talking about between three and 4,000 BC, uh, before the common era, making Jerusalem one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Uh, um, so uh, the siege and the sacking of Jerusalem happened a number of times before and then during and after the Crusades. And just note how many times the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is damaged and rebuilt. Um, 
both um, actually you can't see here, but you know, if you remember going back to a prior slide, um, in t uh, thousand, uh, 1009, 1071, 1149, and then 1808, it was uh, burned by fire. Um, interesting, in, during the Crusader rule, uh, when they had control of Jerusalem, uh, the Dome of the uh, Rock uh, was turned into a church. And after they were thrust out, it became a Muslim shrine again. Uh, in 1244, which is towards the end of the Crusades, St. Francis went to uh, Egypt seeking peace. Uh, Jerusalem actually then was sacked by Tartars who are, remember, they would be from the steppes of uh, Central Asia, came swooping through. Um, but then Islamic rule was reestablished for 300 years, which the Mamelukes, which I believe were for, the, they were the Tartars uh, from the steppes Persia and farther to the east. And then the Ottomans came and had uh, assumed uh, uh, power. And the Ottoman rule was uh, centered in Turkey. And 1517, they took over Jerusalem. And Sultan Suleiman, Suleiman the Great, uh, was the one who not only uh, retook Jerusalem, built the present day city walls, uh, as, uh, established the holy sites of, of Jerusalem and gave them to the Greek Orthodox to have control over. But it is Suleiman the Magnificent, the same fellow who was also led a, an army into um, Vienna and was knocking on the doors of Vienna. And this is the time of the Refor Reformation. So the Pope, you know, is dealing with, and uh, um, the Holy Rem Emperor, um, was not, we're not only dealing with the uh, Lutheran reformers and, and the Protestant Reformation, but they were dealing with this existential threat of the Muslims to the East. And so um, the reason uh, really Luther and the others were able to, you know, have their say or not be destroyed is because the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope needed all the resources they could ha muster to go to Vienna and to defeat or to push back Suleiman the Magnificent. So it was kind of like that power vacuum that allowed uh, the reformers to have a place in uh, and to establish the Protestant Reformation. So a lot happening at this time. Here we have a picture of Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, and just here, just to, here is his reign at its peak. And you can see it extended pretty much all across Africa to the south, down into Egypt, all of Saudi Arabia, and, and then Turkey and Persia, and then all the way up into the Balkan countries, almost uh, to Vienna. Um, and um, so when we think about um, uh, the war in the Balkans between Serbs and Croats and so forth. In some ways, it was a religious war between uh, Roman Catholics and, um, and Orthodox and the Muslims who were living in that area. So it is sort of a carryover from the invasion of Mameluk uh, or from Suleiman the Magnificent in the 1550s. Um, So uh, the Ottoman Turks had control of the Holy Land for about 400 years, from 1517 to 1917, and the First World War. Uh, in in some ways, um, um, the the when um, the British came into um, uh, the Holy Lands, it was there was kind of a continued disagreement as to who had control over the holy sites, whether, whether it was going to be the Orthodox or the Roman Catholics. Uh, we won't go into that so much. But again, 1970 marked a time of great change in the Holy Land. And at the Balfour Agreement, which actually, so the British, um, uh, stepping back to World War II, the Turks were aligned with the Germans, uh, sort of the Axis power, um, and uh, they were in battle together as partners against the Allies, which would have been France and uh, Britain and America along in Europe. But then it was the British also who were uh, fighting in the Middle East to establish 
uh, to kind of push back uh, the Turks from, or the Ottomans from the Middle East. Uh, if you think of Lawrence Arabia, uh, he was actually a British soldier. Uh, I think it was a, he was a British soldier who um, uh, was a saboteur with uh, the um, um, Saudi Arabians and sought to free Saudi Arabia and the Arabs in the Middle East from Ottoman rule. Um, it was the British who then came in, and 1917, the Turks left Jerusalem, and the British came in. It's the first time that a non-Muslim nation had, in a sense, government control over Jerusalem since uh, the time of the Crusades. The Balfour Agreement uh, uh, established sort of the, the understanding of a place for a Jewish homeland. It also divided uh, the Middle East up into territories of governance or control. It created in some ways the uh, area of, that we know as Iraq, uh, but joining together Kurds, Sunnis, and Shias uh, within one border, and they never got along together. Uh, it took sort of the brutality of Saddam Hussein to kind of keep it as a country, and then when the Americans uh, came in, uh, part of the uh, the trouble in Iraq was not just simply fighting against Iran, but it was simply the difficulty of these three tribes, groups of people, to coexist. Um, so uh, that Balfour Agreement has been a source. We're still living with the consequences of that agreement, uh, but it did uh, uh, state an agreement for the Jews to have a homeland in the ho Holy Land and sort of the end of the pogroms. And uh, there was a kind of a partition planned. Um, in 1948, um, after the Holocaust from World War II, uh, United Nations uh, sort of established a partition plan to grant uh, a holy land, uh, a Jews to have a homeland. And then uh, the Arabs, uh, Israel uh, sort of established uh, themselves as a nation in 1948. Uh, the surrounding Arab states said no, sought to destroy the nation. Uh, Israel fought back and were successful in creating sort of the uh, the larger land of Israel, not including the West Bank, but uh, sort of the nation of Israel. There were a lot of refugees, about 700,000. They were all Palestinians, but those Palestinian refugees were both Christian and Muslim. Uh, perhaps it's been the Christian Palestinians who have lost as much or the most of anyone in the Middle East. Um, there was the war of 1967, the war of 73, each time uh, instigated by uh, the surrounding uh, Arab states to uh, push Israel out each time they lost. Um, and the territory of Israel expanded in 67 and 73. Uh, finally, uh, Israel struck a peace plan with Egypt in 1979 to, in order to return uh, the Sinai Peninsula back to, e uh, to um, Egypt. Uh, and then there was another peace pact with Jordan in 1994. So let's just get a sense of kind of leading into modern day Israel kind of what do we have? So if you look to the left, we have sort of kind of the territory of influence under uh, David and Solomon, sort of kind of the maximum uh, political uh, economic influence of uh, David and Solomon. Some of it, you, you wouldn't necessarily think about all of that as sort of a national territory boundary, but it would be under their maximum influence. When you look to the right, uh, under the partition plan, the red is what was allocated to Israel as, it, as, as the nation. So you see most of it was in the Negev to the south, which is a very dry and arid place. A little bit along the shore, which never really was, uh, if, if you remember, uh, much of uh, considered the land of Israel, and then around uh, the sea or the area of Galilee, uh, which actually was more Christian than uh, Jewish. Uh, but uh, Israel, I said, we'll take it. Um, 
and just simply to have a place where they would not be under persecution. The Arab controlled area was in the area to that is in the yellow and pretty much along the West Bank. Somebody asked, what's the West Bank? Well, it's west of the River Jordan. Uh, that area west of the River Jordan was considered Jewish. And then north of, around Lebanon would have gone down and then the uh, Gaza Strip uh, and to the south. So that was the partition plan in 1947. And then um, you had the border war in 1949 and Israel won. And what the result was is that their territory expanded. Um, and so what was left as the Gaza Strip, which was Palestinian and under separate control, you have the West Bank, which was Palestinian under um, uh, uh, Palestinian uh, control. And then what was red is then uh, the land of Israel. And you might say the uh, pal the West Bank was really under Jordanian control. It wasn't under, under Palestinian, it was Jordanian control. Uh, and then in 1967, the Arab states sought to push Israel uh, out uh, and they lost. And what happened is that Israel then took control, military control of the Sinai Peninsula, took military control of the West Bank, uh, and took military control of the Golan Heights. Um, since then, there's been sort of a time of return. Uh, the Sinai was, Peninsula was turned to Egypt with Anwar Sadat. The Gaza Strip and the West Bank were returned to Palestinian control, um, uh, though uh, the Palestinian control of the West Bank has really been altered over time. Um, and such that when we look at today, uh, what is a Palestinian control is very little. Uh, you have the Gaza Strip down by the Mediterranean Sea that, sea that is still under a Palestinian governance. And then you have um, uh, the West Bank, but you realize only the dark green areas are under Palestinian governance. The light green areas are kind of a mix of uh, Palestinian government, governance and Israeli control. And then the pink is pretty much all under military uh, control and also is the site of um, West Bank establishments, uh, settlers moving in. You have the pink area where pretty much Israel has now taken over and they have built the wall uh, around those areas um, and settlements are, have been put in. And so uh, the wall has redefined what is considered um, the West Bank. Um, and um, the wall from on the Israeli side is just, it doesn't necessarily look that big a wall, maybe 10 feet or whatever. But on the uh, Palestinian side, that wall is often a 35 foot demarcation, sort of a prison uh, wall. So it, it's, there's been a certain kind of brutality about that. But uh, Israel has said, we have to do that for self-defense. But, but anyway, this, this, the, the land of the West Bank is now uh, deeply compromised, deeply divided. And if you think about it, if you live in a Palestinian, one of those green areas, uh, but a, every road that leads out of a green area has a check checkpoint. And it can take two to three hours simply to go from one place to the next. And so life has become very difficult um, and uh, uh, for Palestinians who live in the West Bank. So that uh, kind of brings us up to speed a little bit with uh, kind of the history of uh, the Holy Lands from the really the time of Jesus to the present day. And um, we will uh, next time uh, talk more about um, kind of uh, uh, the sort of the religion uh, in the time of Jesus and uh, um, and how the Christian Church was really an expression of Judaism at the time. So more of that. I wish you a great day, uh, week, and uh, God be with you. Bye bye.